L.A. is a great big freeway. I didn't say that. Hal David did. And Dionne Warwick sang it in Do You Know the Way to San Jose, just one of the Back Rack David classics she recorded in the 60s, including Anyone Who Had a Heart, Walk On By, and You'll Never Get to Heaven. In the 70s, she had an American number one with the Detroit Spinners, a Grammy Award winner produced by Barry Manilow, and another Grammy winner written by Isaac Hayes. In the 80s, she's had a multi-million seller written by the Bee Gees. And on her latest album, duets with Stevie Wonder, Barry Manilow, and Glenn Jones. Everyone loves and wants to work with Dionne Warwick. Like several artists who emerged in the 60s, you began in gospel music. Right. Could you have foreseen circumstances in which you would have stayed with gospel? I still am with gospel. I've never left it. It's... Uh was born and raised in that area and I will always be there. Um, I didn't really foresee being a pop artist either. I was kind of uh, thrown into it and fortunately, as it turned out, I had a hit record, so the emergence of Dionne Warwick. But uh, it was not a planned situation. I had intentions of being a wonderful course stenographer and traveling an awful lot and that was what I had planned to do. Eventually, um, those plans changed because I went on to college and, be, and majored in music education, so then I was going to be the best educator that there was musically. And uh, I met two men named Backrack and David. They, legends has it, discover you singing a backing role on Mexican Divorce by the Drifters. That's right. Is that, in fact, the case? That is absolutely true. I met Bert first. He had written a song with Bob Hilliard subsequently gone on and uh, Bert was telling me that he had just started a collaboration with Hal David and that they would be writing songs and would I be interested in doing demonstration records for them. Um, we did an awful lot of background work in the studios in New York anyway for other record companies and uh, some of the background David songs that were being recorded by other people we ended up doing oohs and ahs and yeah yeahs as well um, and eventually during my Senior year of college was when they literally badgered me, and that's the word I have to use, into recording, and I did. And they wrote a song called Don't Make Me Over. Don't make me over. perfect trio after a couple more records anyone who had a heart yes in britain of course you're pipped on that one by Stella black uh-huh now at the time <laughs> at the time were you upset oh desperately yes i was absolutely crushed well, it turns out it didn't really matter because next time out with walk on by right you had a hit in britain as well as in the united states exactly if you see me walking down the street and i start to cry each time with me Walk on by, yes. Walk on by. Make me believe that you don't see the tears. Let me grieve in the private cause each time I see you, I break down and cry. Oh, times album tracks of yours would emerge as other artists singles yes I, I think of close to you which right. became a number one for the carpenters mm -hmm. for example or what the world needs now is love jackie DeShannon. so many uh, did you ever mind yeah <laughs> of course i did but it's like when it uh with jackie well i was kind of miffed about that one a bit because um what the world needs now is love is written for Gene Pitney. And it was written with a country and western feel, a lope to it. Um, Jackie DeShannon was at that time recording for Liberty Records and Backrack David were obligated to produce another album for her. Uh, and they needed another song. And 
What they did was they took my formula, or what they considered the formula for recording Dionne Warwick, and uh, recorded Jackie with it. And uh, to this day, in fact, when people mention what the world needs now is love, they mention my name before they mention her, and actually she recorded it before I did. And uh, she tells a funny story about recording that song. He gave her strep throat because he kept wanting to hear me come through the microphone at him, and it was her standing there singing. And the poor baby ended up in the hospital at the recording and a triple session on top of it. You mentioned that uh, What the World Needs Now is Love was meant for Gene Pitney. Of course, Backrack and David did a lot of hits with him, including oh, 24 yes. Hours from Tulsa. You sang the demos of some of these? I did all the demos on all of the songs that Backrack David ever wrote. And uh, it's kind of nice to see hit records come out of it for other people. Songs like Any Day Now, with Chuck Jackson, I did the demo for that. Um, it wasn't quite a demo, but Wishing and Hoping with Dusty Springfield took from the B-side of uh, one of my records at This Empty Place. She had a tremendous hit with that. Um, wow, Close to You, which was a demo, and ended up on my one of my first early albums. And of course, The Carpenters enjoyed a great deal of success with that. Um, I think probably the only song I never did as a demo was What the World Needs Now is Love. Yes, I did. I did it in the form that, that Pitney was going to record it in. So you did do it first? Yes, I did. What the world needs now is my sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just to do love. What the world Here I Am, yeah. from What's New Pussycat, That's right. in which several artists did Backrack David songs. Did you see the part of the film your song would be over before you did it? No, I didn't. I wish I had. <laughs> I, to see Ursula Anders drop out of the sky into a car didn't say, here I am. <laughs> you know? That was more What's New Pussycat, you know. But it was, uh, it was nice to be associated with a hit film. And even more directly so with Alfie, of course, yeah. for which Burt wins a Grammy Award for arrangement. Yeah, certainly did, and should have won the Oscar that year, too. He really should have. But uh, I think it was an All-American year that year, because Born Free won. I'll never forget it as long as I live. They were really, I don't think, justifiably routed out of that. They well. should have won. You won the, the battle in the States with Scylla Black, and, uh, and actually Cher was in on that one as well. Oh, wasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think the world, in fact, that was the 43rd person to record Alfie. The it was, uh, well, Hal and Bert had, uh, both explained to me that they were writing the song for a British film, and British money, of course, was taking care of the, uh, the bill, and they wanted to have a British recording artist to record the title song, which I got upset again about when I heard who it was that they wanted to do it. Um, however, I felt that, okay, fine, you know, that that's something I have no control over, neither did they. And when it came to the States, because of the distribution of United Artists distributing the film, they wanted one of their artists to do the title, so Cher did the title there. And ironically, when it was released, in Australia, they didn't want anybody singing it, so Sonny Rollins did the title song for, for the Australian release. And by the time Burton Howe said, well, why don't you record it? I said, if you've got 40 recordings, what do you need me for? I mean, Andy Williams, uh, Jack Jones, The World, Sarah Vaughan, Elvis Gerald even. And I just thought there was no reason to record the song. And we finally needed a song to fill out an album and uh, threw it in there. 
came out as a hit single. What's it all about? What's it all about when you sort it out? How be are we meant to take more than we give? Are we meant to? Have an even bigger hit with a theme from the film Valley of the Dolls. Yeah, sure did. And this time it's Dory Previn. That's right, right. Dory and Andre. That's right. Wrote this song for the film, which uh, I was thrilled about. I was really very excited about. First of all, Miss um, Park and Parker, who uh, kind of uh, said I was the one singing the song. She had been a fan, had all my albums, and there weren't that many to have, but she had the ones that I had available. And she says, nobody else that could sing it but her. And I went in and did it. Um, ironically, the film became a hit because the song was a hit. And that was one of those times that I loved because Hal David, who I think is a master lyricist, just felt that it was not the right song and it just never would be a hit record. And if it was a hit record, I'd eat it. And I gave him salt and pepper. It was wonderful. I said, here I eat it. As it turned out, it was the B-side of I Say a Little Prayer. And we had a double-sided gold record with it. So it was really nice. That's right. They were both top five titles mm -hmm. in the United States. And then, strangely enough, a year later, Aretha Franklin... Did I Say a Little Prayer. And has her own double-sided. That's right. <laughs> Obviously a great song. It, it will always be a hit. The moment I wake up
finally, we're getting some Grammy Awards uh, of your own. Do you know the way to San Jose? Yeah. And that uh, is an international hit. Right. And, and almost uh, different in the sense of being a very light record for you at the time. It was. It really was compared to the, the big ballads that I was accustomed to singing and actually was noted for. And uh, one of the songs that I, I really didn't want to sing, <laughs> but then what do I know? Uh, uh, Hal David was stationed, I believe, in San Jose during his enlistment time and fell in love with San Jose and wrote a song about it compared to Los Angeles in the fast pace. Um, it, that was a year for threes with me. It was 1968, I got the Grammy, 1969 was my gold record and also the first born of my family. So it was a wonderful year for me. Well, in 1970 you struck again with another Grammy. But first I'll ask you if you've heard the Frankie Goes to Hollywood version of Do You Know the I Lesson? sure have. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a reaction? Uh, Yes. <laughs> Is it printable? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's different. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll wonder if they will then cover I'll Never Fall in Love Again. I doubt it. <laughs> for which you win a Grammy in 1970. Yes. And interestingly enough, two hit songs from a Broadway show. By that time, there weren't many Broadway shows generating hits. That's Hair right. was the only exception, really. And uh, Backrack David, of course, wrote that yes. show, Promises, Promises. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, given first dibs? Actually, I was. Um, on Promises, nobody could sing it but me, as it turns out. Uh, I'll Never Fall in Love Again was written after the play had already been open in Boston, in fact. And uh, they needed a song for Jill to sing. And Hal David wrote it. Bert came up with a lovely melody that she could play on the guitar and sing. Um, Ella Fitzgerald recorded it first as a single release and was getting ready to have a hit record with it. God only knows what happened. And Bert and Hal was saying, you've got to record a song. And the way in the world I'm going to cover Ella Fitzgerald. Are you crazy? And we sat and waited until she went on the charts. And when she was coming down, I went to the studios and recorded it. But I would not record it before then. What do you get when you call it I was in the throes of um, the the parting of Backrack David, and also one of Brothers Records. I was on that label at the time. I I think they fell prey to exactly what a lot of other people did. Well, can she sing anybody else other than Backrack David? How do we promote her if she's not with Backrack David? What will she sound like outside of? Instead of looking at the talent as obviously has been looked at subsequently. Um, and they just didn't know what to do with me. And unfortunately, my record suffered for it. Well, you did have five years without a big hit. That's now right. you can look back on it. But at the mm -hmm. time, was it painful? It was. It was very painful because I literally, I, I finally ended up telling Mo and Joe, Mo Austin and Joe Smith, I said, if you don't want me to sing anymore, record, I'll just quit singing. I, mean, I don't need you to stop my recording career. And I know that they really wanted to do something wonderful for me. It's just that they didn't know how. They didn't know what to do with Dion Warwick. I was not R&B, I was not pop, I wasn't jazz, I wasn't, they didn't know what I was. And all they had to do was ask Blanche Greenberg. She'd have been more than happy to tell them, <laughs> you know. Uh, as it turned out, I guess that five-year period of time also worked in my behalf, because during that period, there emerged a music called disco. And Dion Warwick well, we didn't fit into that at all. So it really gave me a chance to sit back, reevaluate, and decide if I wanted to jump on the bandwagon, which I opted not to, and I thank God that I had enough sense to, to, to say, no, that's not you. That's definitely Donna Summers, and she's wonderful doing it. Um, 
and just kind of bide my time. Um, because through it all, and, and I mean, this is my 23rd year in the business, I found that it evolves in, in fives and sevens, music does. And there always has to be a, a danceable music. And there always has to be something that's so far out that nobody understands it but those people who are involved with it. But there's always the good music, the songs that people do want to hear and do want to rest up and listen to and say, oh, boy, if I could really say that to the person that I want to be with or if I maybe if I sent this record, I might be able to make headway with. And I, so I sing those kinds of songs, and those songs will live forever. I don't care what comes or goes. Well, you did come back in 1979 on the recording front. Great success, a comeback with Barry Manilow. Right. I'll never love this way again. No, I'll never love this way again, right? Top five record gives you a Grammy Award. Yes. Was it sweeter the second time around? In more ways than one, I must say. Uh, I was still, of course, feeling the sting of the Backrack David situation. It had not been that long since the suit and everything else was over with. I had just signed with Arista Records after leaving Warner Brothers Records with such a lull. Um, it was kind of saying, yes, I can. And yes, there are still people who truly believe I can. And here's the proof, you know. So it was just a, a wonderful year for me. 79, 80, 81 were just phenomenal years for me. I, um, I did win a Grammy Award. <laughs> My dears, oh, I, um, wait a minute, let <laughs> me compose myself. Here, she told me not to cry. <laughs> I'd like to just say thank you so very, very much. There are just a couple of people that I must say an immense thank you to. Clive Davis, Barrister Records, for believing in me and for coupling me with the producer of the album of which this beautiful song comes from, Barry Manilow. You had another marvelously successful collaboration with The Gibbs mm -hmm. and Heartbreaker. All right. Your biggest record ever in Britain. That's right, in the whole continent as well, all of Europe. I've never had a record as big, and it was, it was fun. Was it a, a different kind of studio experience? Um, you know, by and large, no. They are very, very um, professional. And they are also perfectionists. I mean, they don't want to hear one note different, really. I mean, I did have a little bit of swing with Bert, but I mean, uh, but it got to the point where they kind of relied upon me to do what I do best, as I relied upon them to do what they do best. And we finally got into the groove, and it worked. Why do you have to be a
Well, you recently had uh, a reunion with Barry Manilow. Yes. And then without your love. Right. And indeed, uh, a duet mm -hmm. of a Gibbs song. So when, in a sense, it's all friends together. Friends together. Run and to I me. must also add another reunion with Burt Bacharach. Well, you had an important role in the making of the film The Woman in Red in oh, 1984 yes, as yes. musical coordinator, I suppose yes. you'd call it. Mm -hmm. How did you get that selection? It was the funniest thing in the world. I had met Gene Wilder here in London many years ago. And uh, I subsequently had seen him socially in Los Angeles again. Well, he wanted me to do the title song for the film. And that basically was what I was brought in to see the film, to see if I wanted to be a part of it. And I loved it. It was a wonderful film. I laughed a lot, and I said, yes. And he, in turn, asked me who it was that I thought I'd like to sing with. Now, they were using as working music throughout the film the Lionel Richie album. And he had, of course, preconceived ideas as to who he would like to have me sing with. And Lionel, of course, was his choice. And I said I would call Lionel to see if he was available. And Lionel, unfortunately, was, and his schedule wouldn't permit. And I made the suggestion to Gene that we give Stevie Wonder a call. And he said, can you get Stevie Wonder? I said, well, I think if anybody can, I can. And I gave Steve Lynn a call, and he said, are you serious? I said, yes, I'm serious. And he was in New York. New York. He flew in to, quote, see the film. And he did see the film, and I, I now firmly believe inside that he did. There's no way in the world he could have written music that coincided exactly the way that this, this music did to this film without seeing it. And, uh, well, uh, the rest obviously is history. I am just, nobody could be prouder, first of all. I've known Steve Lynn since he was this big, and uh, no more thrilled is enjoying this kind of success with it. It's just, it's supposed to be. It really is. It was a giant success, of course. I just called to say I love you, his oh, biggest hit. It's gonna be a national anthem pretty soon. Is your career wonderful? Are you satisfied? Uh, the recording aspect of it, yes. Very, very, very much. I still have those other three awards to get. The Oscar, the Emmy, and the Tony, so. Until that happens, I'm not going to ever be satisfied. In other words, despite 23 successful years, you haven't run out of energy. Oh, no. I'm just beginning. <laughs>